Good morning, men. We'll get started here in just a minute. I wanted to take a moment and just uh, say thank you for being part of the Bible study this year. I hope you've had a good year. And uh, also, I wanted to, to, to tell you about an opportunity for you to get more involved in what we're doing. So when we uh, disciple men, everyone wins. And I want to invite you to be part of that winning team. So uh, I'm going to ask you to take out your, your phone. You can do that right now, your phone, and go to mimdonate.org, mimdonate.org, and just take a look at the case that we make there for becoming involved in uh, reaching more men. And I want to encourage you, as uh, you consider your own generosity here at the end of the year, to become involved, if you're not already, as a Man in the Mirror uh, partner, either with a one-time gift or become a, a monthly partner. And for all of those of you who are already part of the deal, thanks so much. And by the way, we will use this money to reach more men through this Bible study. So thanks so much. So today we're going to look at an extremely uh, elegant contribution to the Christmas story. We're going to look at the story of the, the Magi, the, or the three wise men, as we uh, call them. And <clears throat> the title of the message today is, you know, what we learn from the wise men, okay? We're going to begin at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And so the first thing I want us to look at this morning is this, you know, why are men moved or inspired or motivated or prompted to seek Jesus? What is it that prompts men to seek Jesus? What motivated these three wise men to update their passports and go over to Bethlehem to see if they could find the king of the Jews? What is it? What is the desire, the deep desire in a man that makes him want to seek Jesus? So, <clears throat> Augustine said, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. So, we each have a God instinct. There's something of the divine nature that has been deposited in every human being throughout the world. And so men go seeking after God because they have a little bit of the divinity uh, in their DNA, this God instinct, so, so as it is. I'm going to read to you a little bit from uh, uh, my book, Man Alive. I, I, I generally don't quote authors unless they're dead because that way I know they can't embarrass me later, but in this case I'm gonna make an exception. I'm just going to read a, a little bit from the chapter on soul making. This book, Man Alive, deals with the uh, seven uh, primal needs, the most uh, dominating inner aches and pains that men have. You've heard me talk about these. We did a series or two on it. You know, I just don't feel like uh, God cares about me personally. I feel like I'm in this alone. I don't feel like my life has purpose. It feels random. Uh, my soul feels dry. I have these destructive behaviors that keep dragging me down. Uh, my most important relationships are not healthy. And number seven, I don't really feel like I'm doing anything that will make a difference and leave the world a better place. And that's just the result of literally thousands of one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, you know, over 40 years of meeting with two or three guys or so every week, one-on-one, uh, -on -one. just kind of the, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the taxonomy, if you will, that, I came, uh, that I've come up with, that I just see those are the themes that just repeat over and over again. And so in responding to this, this one, uh, you know, I just feel like my soul is dry. I, I, I write 
I write this. Contrary to what you might pick up at the movies or from guys at the ballpark, men are driven by much deeper needs than food, sex, sports, and beer. That's because you and I have a soul. Our souls are made to long for communion with God. That's another way of talking about this uh, divinitatis sensum, the sense of the divine, the God instinct that Martin Luther uh, referred to. In this chapter, I'm going to show you what it means to live with an ache in your soul for something more, something outside yourself and what God wants you to do about it. I describe the primal need of a man's soul like this. Every man has a deep need in his soul to experience transcendence and awe for satisfying personal encounters with God. A man can dodge this need and his soul may lay dormant for years. But sooner or later, he will long to satisfy the God-given thirst of his soul for communion with his maker. Do you remember the first time you felt this longing? If you're willing to let it, this powerful primal need can draw you into a soul-filling experience that makes you want to shout, I'm alive. I'm alive. So there are a lot of dead men walking out there, and they, they, but they know that the reason that there's so much ache and pain when we feel dead in our souls or dry in our souls, it's, it, it's because we, we instinctively and intuitively know every human being. Cicero talked about it. There is no society so barbaric that they do not have a concept of God anywhere, ever. Uh, there's, everybody knows that, that there is a God and there's this deep yearning, this deep longing, this deep desire that God has put, God has set eternity in men's hearts, it says in Ecclesiastes. Every man, woman, boy and girl has this. I remember as an acolyte, as a little boy in, in, in the, uh, the Episcopal Church, um, I used, I remember, I just, I remember even as a young boy, I, didn't, I did not become a, a follower of Jesus until I was in my 20s, but, but even as a little boy, as an acolyte, down at the, uh, we were out at uh, a mission church in Pine Hills, but then we'd go down to the, the big church, the big Episcopal Cathedral in downtown Orlando. From t- and I remember, I just remember so wanting, so wanting to, to know God. I mean, that, I mean, I just wanted to know God. And I remember I would read that common book of prayer, and I just remember I would read, and my, God, my eyes were glazing over most of the time, but I would just keep reading. I was wanting to hear from God. I was seeking God. I wanted, to, I wanted a God that I could worship, just like these three men. They came from the East, so they were probably Gentiles. Uh, uh, they, they, they may have been men of authority. They could have been kings themselves. Who knows exactly? Uh, you know, there's, there are a lot of different interpretations of what this is. The word magi literally, mean, literally means magician, but it's generally thought that these were three wise men, at least, that had come. But they, it says, we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. There is no need that's more innate than this need that we have, this yearning that we have to worship. And that's why churches all over the world are going to, their populations are going to swell over the next few days because this need is in every human heart. And it's worldwide. I, when I was on this trip to Asia, that I went on, uh, we had hundreds of people responding to altar calls. It was, it was, it was crazy. And I, I remember that uh, most of the things were with men, but I remember this one church that I preached a sermon in, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, I got it mixed up, Malaysia. I, I was in Malaysia. And I was preaching, and I did an altar call. Hundreds of people were coming up. And... Uh, 
and then there were these counselors and so forth up front, and there was a, a young woman from China, uh, a, a sweet young college-age girl from, from China, and uh, she came up and she said, uh, she said, I want to become a disciple of this Jesus. I want to become a disciple of this Jesus. And of course, she, and she did. And of course, then she's going to go back to China. And she's going to take, take, take this back to China. Well, do you know that China is, now has the largest Christian population of any country in the world? There are 100 million estimated uh, born-again Christians in China. Uh, you hear different reports, but I, uh, the people in China say that the China the Chinese Christian church is the fastest growing Christian population in the world. So it, this is a universal need. It, it, you know, people, I'm not going to get into the, into the four systems, but, you know, the worldly system, the moral system, the religious system, and then the Christian system. Well, people get tired of the worldly system. And then, and then they actually want to do something righteous, and so they try to be moral and right. They can't do that in their own strength, so then they decide to become religious. And then after a while, they figure out, that there's no power in religion, and, and every religion except Christianity is basically based on performance. If I behave uh, correctly and do enough good things, then I'll be okay, and, and they can't do that because there's not enough moral strength in any of us to do that, and, and so ultimately, uh, they take the traces of their different religions, and, and if they're fortunate, they make it to Christianity, the Christian system, where it's the only system in the world uh, that, that depends on your inability to be righteous. Uh, and so, we all have this incredible need wherever we are in the system. And so, here's the big idea for the day. I have a deep, <laughs> I have a deep hunger to find the God who is worthy of my worship. I have a deep, deep hunger to find the God who is worthy of my worship. And these men, they had probably were men of means, and they come from law. It would be like, it would be just like, um, it'd be like you being willing to go uh, from, from here to China um, and, sp and spend a good part of your money and a lot of time to do it to satisfy a deep ache. That's what these men are doing. And that's also what drives us to seek Jesus. Secondly, you know, how did God guide these men to Jesus? Well, he gave them a star. Let's read verses 3 to 10. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. You know why he was disturbed? Well, he was king of the Jews. Did you, you know that? He was king of the Jews. So they come looking for the king of the Jews. He was king of the Jews. Yeah, he was, he was disturbed. He was a pretty wicked guy. Uh, it was said of Herod that I'd, uh, somebody said, I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son because he uh, killed, killed at least one of his sons. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet Micah has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by the way, this is written about 750 B.C., plus or minus, so uh, 750 years before Christ, this prophecy was written by Micah. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them 
until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So, how did God guide them there? God gave them a star. How does God guide men and women, boys and girls today? God will always provide a star to help us find Jesus. God will always give us a star to help him find him. In my own case, it turns out God gave me an actual star (laughs) to, to help me find Jesus. So I didn't find God as an acolyte as a young boy. When I was in college, I went out with a a girl a a few times, and she lived in what was then called the Capistrano Apartments, near 436 and Maitland Avenue on Lake Orienta. And so one night, there's a little peninsula that sort of, well, like, let's just call it a quarter of a peninsula, that juts out into Lake Goriana. And so we went out there one night, and we, we laid down a blanket on the, the bank of the lake and uh, on, on the, the grass with, with dew and everything, and, and uh, laid on our backs, and we're looking up into the sky in silence. I wrote about this also in Man Alive, but I, I, uh, I said it, the, that person was Robert. It was really, it was really me. Uh, I'm Robert, <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, I just remember laying on my back and looking up into what was a, a beautiful, clear, uh, star-studded sky, and uh, I just remember all of a sudden, boom, it hit me. I was a sense of overwhelm with the, the gravitas of it all, and it was a sense of... Uh, of God's transcendence. Uh, it was a, there was something personal ab- about the cosmos all of a sudden. The, the, the real is, I don't know what. I really don't even know how to explain it. But I was overwhelmed in my emotions. I couldn't speak. I didn't want to speak. And uh, after a few minutes, the feeling went away, and I returned to my secular way of thinking and living for the next several years. But it, uh, it had struck a match inside of me. God had given me a star. After all those years of looking for God, I, you know, as a young boy, I mean, I'm out looking for him, you know. I'm in the church. I'm out looking for him. I'm, you know, taking the incense, uh, graduating, you know, up. I got the black lanyard. Eventually, I got the purple one, you know, and so I'm the, I'm the head acolyte now, you know, and, and so I'm the head acolyte, and so what am I? You know, I'm proud of myself, for, for being the top guy. You know, uh, my motivation, I'm so competitive. You know, I had the black, uh, I think you start, maybe you start out with a string and then you go to a little black thing and then to a purple thing. I, I don't really remember, but all I remember is that whichever one I was on, I always wanted the next one, you know? And so I, would, I was willing to, to, to work and do everything necessary to get the next one so that I could kind of compete with myself and maybe somebody else too. But I never, I never really, I never really had that, that sense of uh, transcendence. But even then, looking back now, that was a type of star. That was a type of star. There was something that was stirring inside of me. John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus himself says this, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we don't, we don't go looking for Jesus Jesus draws us to go looking, uh, the Father draws us to go looking for him. Uh, There's nothing in any of us, if we look at the sin, if if we each were to examine just the sin that we did yesterday, we would be so repulsed. We would be be so ashamed. There is not a man in this room who would not suffer severe embarrassment just for, to be known for the sins, that, that, uh, especially in our thoughts, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, we, would be, we would feel like we had been found out. So there's really nothing in us, intrinsically. Uh, Jeremiah 79, the heart is desperately wicked and beyond cure. Who can understand it? 
Paul says, you know, I don't understand myself. Uh, what I don't want to do, uh, I, 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 I do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. And so, uh, you know, why do I keep doing what I don't want to do? Uh, as it is, it's not me doing it. It's sin living in, in me. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? Well, it's, it's Jesus. And God gives us each of this, this star to help us find him. I thought of some other ones too, depression. You know, I know depression is a bad thing, but I wouldn't write depression off because it, it was, I remember the sadness that led me to quit high school. And then I remember the sadness that I had in the army that drew me back to church, back to church where there was no gospel. But nevertheless, I didn't know anything about gospel at that time, but I, I was looking. It drew me back to church, you see. And then I left again <laughs> uh, until, uh, you know, I got stirred again in that episode looking into the stars. And then in my early business career, I, another depression but it's, and I was already, I had already professed Christ, but I was quickly uh, uh, abandoning. You know, it's kind of like I prayed the prayer and then I went back to living my old life, you see. And it was, and I was depressed. And God has used each of those depressions as, as a star to help me find him or find him again or lead me back to him. Success, success. Don't underestimate success as a star. Because uh, when you are successful, you know, the poor have this advantage over the rich. They can still cling to the illusion that money will make them happy. But anybody who's ever had money knows that money won't make you happy. And when you have it, uh, success doesn't make you happy. Success makes you miserable. Success makes you miserable unless it's uh, as a response just simply to being faithful and then God blesses you. But if, 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 it's, if it's the goal, if it's the thing you want that you think, it, if I could just make that this much money, I'll be happy or live in that house, then I'll, feel, then I'll be okay. That, and, and you get that and you feel the emptiness of it. Again, that's a star that can lead a man to Jesus. So be, uh, to Jesus. So be on, on the lookout, you know, when you're out and about. I'm on the, always on the lookout at the gym for guys whose demeanor changes. You know, they're happy, 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 and now all of a sudden they're not. And I've got a guy like that. I tried to approach him here a couple weeks ago uh, I, I, to, for Thanksgiving. I said, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, I hope you have a nice Thanksgiving. Um, and he said, uh, ah, it's not important. It's not important. You should uh, give the money to the poor, something like that. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, wow. I, I mean, you know, this is beyond me. It's beyond my pay grade. I, I wouldn't know how to reach, reach him. Uh, but God can use that deep depression that he's got. And I don't know if his if, uh, if is this from success or failure, but he has it. And so I feel like he's a prime candidate. You know, God will always give us a star to find him. Of course, you have to look up to see it. But sometimes we are that star in the other person's life. So when a guy looks up who needs Jesus, he's, he, he's feeling the, 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 the deep hunger of the soul for what or who? He may not even know it's for God yet, you see. He may not even know that that deep need that he has, that he's feeling, right, yet is for God. But it is. And God's always going to provide a star for him to find Jesus if he'll look up. And what if when he looks up, he sees you? Are you shining? Or have you turned the switch off because you don't want to be embarrassed in public? I was with a guy in the gym Wednesday. And so uh, he was asking if I was on this particular machine. I said, no. And he said, awesome. I said, and he said, Merry Christmas. I said, well, Merry Christmas to you too. He said, yeah, it's going to be a good one. He said, I'm blessed. And then he said, I'm blessed, which is, you know, a, a little bit of a, you know, cultural code to put a little feeler out, you know. And so uh, I said, oh, I said, uh, well, me too. I said, uh, are, uh, are you a follower of Christ? He said, yeah, I am. He said, and, and I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
And I thought to myself, wow, this guy's got his lights on. <laughs> he was very bold. He was very bold. He's in the process of starting a pressure cleaning business. A young guy starting a pressure cleaning business. Gave him a copy of The Man in the Mirror. Uh, was, his name is Rodney. Pray for Rodney. Pray Rodney be extraordinarily successful because I know that wherever he goes, he's going to be somebody's star. He's going to be somebody's star. If, if, you, if you're willing to turn the light on and, and go out and uh, not be ashamed of the gospel, then I'm, I want to pray for you too. I am praying for you too. I pray for you every week. So, there are many other ways, you know, Patsy's prayers for me, Patsy's prayers, having children, Asbury United Methodist Church, where the pastor preached the gospel from the pulpit and where H.O. Giles, Bob Helmling, took me out to lunch, two young guys, and where Jim Gillian, an older man, took me under his wing, discipled me on how to uh, be a godly man, husband, and, uh, and then to Lyle Nelson and his wife, Marge, who <clears throat> all those years ago invited us to uh, a, a young parenting class. And all of those different things for me, th these people are all stars. These situations, these places, they're all stars that God has used to guide me. And you can think back in your life, too, how God has always given you a star to find it, but if you are willing to look up to see it. And so it is for everybody else. And the reason we do look up, the reason we do look up is because of the big idea, because we have a deep hunger to find this God who is worthy of our worship. And then finally, you know, so what, what should we do when we find him, let's look at verse 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. What should we do when we find him? What did the wise men do when they found him? On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So what did they do when they found him? They worshiped him, they gave him gifts, and they protected Jesus as well. So you know, how did they protect him? <laughs> Today, the way they protected him, of course, was by not disclosing his location. The way we protect Jesus today is by doing exactly the opposite. The way we protect Jesus today is by disclosing his location. The way we protect the gospel, the kingdom, is by spreading it, by making disciples, by uh, being prepared to give anyone who wants to know the reason for the hope we have in us the answer to be the star for them that would help guide them to find Jesus. Second, you know, how do we worship? How do we worship? Well, the word worship literally means, the, the Greek word literally means to kiss, the way a dog licks its master's hand. That's what it means to worship. So I have a, uh, a, uh, a prayer that I pray. I have several prayers I pray. I pray this one several times a week. And uh, it starts out, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. And, and I just encourage you to, if, if you only do this once, it'd be great, but just to, to come in that spirit of worship. Uh, to me, you know, it, uh, the communion with God is, it, it's, it's like, uh, well, it's the same for everybody. Everybody wants to have this deep, personal, affectionate relationship with their creator. And so I pray, uh, Lord, you 
are worthy. Sometimes you alone are worthy to receive praise, glory, honor, <coughs> power, majesty, dominion, authority, wisdom, wealth, repentance, faith, hope, love, adoration, affection, adulation, reverence, awe, obedience, service, sacrifice, blessing, and thanksgiving. For you are the God who is, who was, and is to come. That's the prayer. I pray that prayer many times a week. That's how, I, that's how I'm able to remember it now. <laughs> I pray it so often. But just pulling in the different things that lead me into a spirit of worship and communion with God. And so that's what they did. They came and they worshiped. They worshiped him. And there are, there are, and for me, it's a present, you see. It's a present that I'm, I'm presenting I'm presenting my worship to him. So when you're trying to think of, well, what kind of present can you give God? Give him yourself. Uh, give him the praise and the glory and the honor that's due his name. Give him the reverence and awe that he deserves. Give, give God the glory. This is, the, uh, this is what he wants. Uh, it, will he take other kinds of presents too? Will he take your tithes and offerings? Absolutely. But you know what? He doesn't even accept those if, if they're given with any other intent than as an act of worship. Did you know that? Uh, if you give, give $20,000 to Man in the Mirror today, and I hope you do, <laughs> I don't care if you worship God or not, just give the money. <laughs> Now, here's, actually, actually, that, if you gave $20,000 today to our church, to your church, to our ministry, it wouldn't mean a thing if you didn't do it as an act of worship. It's the same way with fasting. You know, this is in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the Israelites, they, they were fasting. So God did, didn't approve of their fasting at all because it wasn't being done as an act of worship. So anything that we present to God um, as an act of worship, is something that, that, that would fit into the category of what these men were doing. When they laid down this gold, this incense, this myrrh, they were doing it as an act of worship. And, the, and then so, you know, how, how, do we, how do we worship? Well, on your tables, there are six. There's a, there's a, a blog that I posted called the Six Worship Languages. And these are the different ways, different, different people actually find themselves worshiping to the full, to their maximum, in different ways. Uh, one person, the aesthetic, number one there, this is the person who wants to be overwhelmed by the majesty of God. This could be in church, it could be in creation, but love, the love of beauty, the love of order. Second one is the experientialist. Uh, this is the person who, who wants to, to sing, to be involved in music, to clap hands, um, have a full range of emotions, weep. This is how they experience the Lord, the, the best. The activist... <laughs> can't understand these other two people because the activist wants to be out pounding nails into the roof of a widow's house or setting up chairs for the missions conference or, or doing something to serve some poor needy person, uh, taking somebody to get a cancer treatment. That's the activist. The contemplative, this is my main language. Uh, so the, the contemplative uh, cherishes the inner life and, and just likes to open up to God in the quiet of their own soul and sense God's presence. Uh, uh, my son, our son, 
is an engineer, a computer engineer. And so everything has to add up to him, uh, <laughs> which is a mystery to me because when things add up, I don't, I, it, that's when they don't make sense to me. Uh, it's the mystery of providence itself. I, the contemplative has the ability to live with a high, has a high tolerance for ambiguity, uh, which obviously an engineer does not. So I love the ambiguity of, of the gospel. And, and so uh, there's the contemplative. There's the student. And this is, the, this is my second uh, worship language, if you will. This is the person who is most able to worship God by the study of this word. And then the relational, this is the person who likes to, to be with the brothers and sisters. And they experience God and worship God most uh, when they're bonded together in fellowship. And, they, and they're most torn when there's conflict in the body of Christ too. Now, we all will worship God all six ways, but you probably have one, two, maybe three primary ways. And so I give this to you for you to be able to uh, you know, figure out you know, what you should do uh, when you find him or when you want to find him, when the star leads you to him. But also to think about other people too. Uh, and when you want to be a star in someone's life, don't be the star, you know, uh, Gary Chapman's five love languages. We tend to love the way, you know, we want to be loved. But he says, no, <laughs> figure out the other person's language and then help, you know, love them that way. Well, it's the same thing with worship. If somebody... Uh, it, you know, and this has been a problem in men's discipleship for years is trying to get men to all uh, worship the Lord in a, in, a, in, a, in a single way. And so you've seen the explosion of outdoor activities, archery, hunting, fishing, and, and, and men respond because they are more, many of these men are more prone to this, this aesthetic or the activist instinct you know, of doing some kind of service. So... The big idea today, uh, and then here are the languages. I guess I should have put that up earlier, huh? The big idea today is that, uh, you know, I have a deep hunger. I have a deep hunger within me to find the God who is worthy of my worship. And so does every other person you will meet today. Let us pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, we pray that... Um, the story of the Magi, you, you just, it's, it's a, such a rich and a beautiful, such an elegant contribution to your Christmas story. Uh, all the things we uh, learn here that we would otherwise not know. We thank you for this story. We also pray that you would take and just superintend to each of our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit the message or messages that you would have us take away this morning. And uh, whether that's... Um, whether that's um, coming to seek Jesus, finding the star uh, that would lead us to him, or knowing what to do when we finally do find him. We ask this in your loving name. Amen.